All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night uh, to all who are attending this session on global CAV uh, deployments. I'm sure uh, all of you are familiar with the usual alphabet soup of uh, all of these things, but uh, what we are uh, discussing today would be CAV, which stands for Connected and Auto Autonomous Vehicle Deployments. And I'm honored to moderate this session, which is uh, truly an international panel. This includes members from the US, from England, and from down under, from Australia, where, by the way, I think it's, it's past midnight already. Um, the general format of the session would be that each of the panelists would present uh, what mischief they've been up to in the CAV sphere. Uh, and then uh, after those brief presentations, we'll get into a question and answer session Please type in your questions into the, into the chat box uh, so that uh, we can have a meaningful discussion uh, on the topic uh, after the panelists are done with their uh, small presentations. Um, so as, um, was, uh, as I was introduced earlier, my name is John Abraham. I uh, went to school here in Michigan, uh, US, uh, got my doctorate degree uh, in transportation research, and uh, I work as director of traffic and operations for Macomb County. I will probably go uh, first and uh, do a, a three to four minute presentation on what we've been up to here in Macomb County uh, when it comes to uh, connected and autonomous vehicles. And then uh, I'll start handing over uh, control to uh, the, the panelists and uh, we, I will go from there. So let me try to share my screen and then we'll go from there. So I hope uh, everybody can uh, see the screen here. Uh, of course, uh, this, is, this is the panel and uh, this is the session that you're all in. So um, when it comes to, uh, yeah, Macomb County, you must be wondering where is Macomb County? We are in Michigan, um, on the east uh, side of Michigan. Ann Arbor is somewhere in Washtenaw County in that area. Uh, we are the third uh, most populous county in Michigan and uh, 740 or so traffic signals, 1700 uh, miles of roads. We are also home to a lot of automotive OEMs and also defense contractors and different establishments in Macomb County. So uh, we talked about our robust uh, communication system. We do have uh, you know, multiple gigabits of, uh, of big pipes uh, taking information from our transportation network to our traffic operations center. Again, I'm not delving into too much details. Uh, probably all of you probably know about the wireless technology and the backhauls and all of these different things. Uh, so 9.7 gigabytes is, is our, our big uh, backhaul pipes that comes back into pole zero, which is where our traffic operations center building is uh, located. We have also been modernizing our traffic signal locations with uh, Linux based open uh, uh, architecture traffic controllers, uh, adding uh, many other devices so that we can uh, operate our traffic operations center to the fullest to uh, maintain uh, safety or improve safety and uh, improve mobility within the county. Uh, we talked about our advanced uh, traffic operations center. We are co-located with a few other departments, making it uh, e even better for uh, traffic and safety. We have a 20 by 50, uh, 20 feet by 50 feet, uh, foot uh, video wall. Our operations center for traffic is in the center, in the, in the front there, uh, around eight stations, and then we have 911 dispatch here. So, if you are in an emergency in Macomb County and you call 911 for emergency assistance, uh, it's most likely that the call comes in here. So we have the synergy going on with traffic operations and uh, emergency operations with our emergency operations center also co-located within this uh, area. So this kind of uh, gives, uh, makes uh, this center as, as the nerve center for the entire county's operations, whether it be traffic or emergency operations, and which, which provides a lot of benefits because of this uh, synergy. So uh, when we uh, uh, talked about, or when we started researching about uh, connected vehicles maybe a few years ago, uh, we learned that there could be up to 80% reduction in traffic crashes. And so we started testing with uh, uh, CV 
uh, technologies, connected vehicle technologies. We piloted a number of projects, uh, General Motors, uh, for example, with the, with the red light warning systems. We also did um, um, pilots which uh, with uh, for uh, traffic signal preemption and traffic signal priority with uh, snow plows, with uh, fire trucks and emergency vehicles, and also uh, priority using transit signals, which we demonstrated at one of the ITS World Congress meetings here in Detroit recently. Um, so basically our aim is to uh, improve safety and to um, uh, improve our mobility within our county using connected vehicle technologies. Uh, currently, where are we with uh, connected vehicles? We have around 320 roadside units completely operational with DSRC technology, which we uh, just got done installing. We have a second phase of it. We are installing 200 additional RC units. That's when the FCC ruling came through. So we are going to a um, dual mode uh, roadside unit, which would uh, include both DSRC and CV2X. And then uh, for the third phase, we have a contract on board to do uh, again, DSRC and CV2X dual mode units. So by the end of 2022, we should have every traffic signal, uh, every signalized intersection within Macomb County uh, equipped with connected vehicle technology. Uh, most of it would work both on DSRC and CV2X uh, platforms, so to say. So with that, um, and this is a map, map of our deployment and uh, we are equipped and ready for the next generation of mobility that way. Uh, that's a brief and, um, you know, when it comes to uh, automation CAV technologies, you know, so the connected where technologies start at the number two level, which is defined by IEEE for automation, which is partial automation. And it goes on to three, four and five. And five would be where you get into the car and just drive. Uh, you tell it to take you somewhere and it'll, it'll drive you there. So uh, for the panelists, if you would kind of identify where you are in, in these levels of automation in your presentation, that'd be great so that we have an indication of uh, where you guys are with, with automation itself. That's the end of uh, my uh, presentation uh, for our first panelist. We have uh, Marianne uh, Bonarusa, who holds a, a bachelor's in engineering from the University of Michigan. Currently, she is the Deputy Program Manager for the Ann Arbor Connected Vehicle Environment, the first large-scale real-world deployment of connected vehicles, vehicle infrastructure using dedicated short-range communications, which is DSRC technology. Uh, she has more than 25 years of automotive research experience. And with, uh, without much further ado, let me invite Marianne to uh, uh, make her remarks. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. I'd like to talk to you uh, for a few minutes about the Ann Arbor Connected Environment and what we've been deploying in Ann Arbor. The Ann Arbor Connected Environment is the first uh, large scale real world deployment of connected vehicles and infrastructure using DSRC technology. And currently we have 75 infrastructure RSUs deployed. 69 of those are production sites. And of those 69, 61 are at intersections where SPAT and MAP are being broadcast. There are two curve speed warning sites, four pedestrian mid-block crosswalks, where we've been conducting a pedestrian study over the last year or so, one roundabout, and then we have five staging or test sites. On the vehicle side, we have about 2,000 onboard units, and about half of those are running eight applications, which includes an HMI for the driver. So they're receiving warnings like forward crash warning, red light violation warning, per speed warning. U of M's routes and connected vehicles, as I mentioned, date to 2012 with safety pilot model deployment. And uh, this deployment featured 25 uh, RSUs in the Northeast side of Ann Arbor and about 2,800 DSRC equipped vehicles. From there, we transitioned to the Ann Arbor Connected Vehicle Environment in 2015. And the goal was to transition this to a, 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 an early operational deployment. 
Additionally, AACVTE expanded the infrastructure footprint to all of the city of Ann Arbor. And there were 75 sites, as I mentioned. During this transition, all of the standards changed and currently all of the devices deployed in the environment meet the 2016 standards. And we have a production SCMS deployed as well. For the past two years, we've been in an operations and maintenance phase where data are being collected and used by developers and researchers. Pedestrian safety research and misbehavior detection are just two of the many ongoing projects in the environment. And since it's an open environment, we know that developers and OEMs and others can just drive to Ann Arbor and use the environment for their testing and application development. And then recently, as you heard in Henry Liu's uh, opening remarks, we picked up a smart intersections project that I'll discuss in uh, more detail in a few minutes. There's been tremendous investment in the last 10 years in Ann Arbor on the vehicle, connected vehicle and infrastructure deployment, beginning at safety pilot and ending uh, which will be in 2024, the Smart Intersection Project, there's been nearly $70 million invested. And that includes federal funds, state, fund, state funding, as well as private partners. As you might imagine, there's a tremendous amount of data that has been generated in this deployment. And I'd like to talk about a few of those data sources. As I mentioned, we have about 2000 vehicles deployed in the environment. Many of those are just owned by lay participants who come and, and work with us and allow their vehicles to be equipped. And on board those vehicles, we are collecting data in the form of PCAPs. All of the BSMs that are generated and transmitted are written to a micro SD card. Subjects return on tree yearly and we download their vehicles and then send them back out to drive for another year. On the infrastructure side, the RSUs are offloading their PCAP files about once an hour. And additionally, they are um, forwarding uh, BSMs that they're collecting. They're seeing as vehicles drive by the RSU, as well as SPAT data that is being streamed from the controller. And the final piece of data that I would like to talk about is the pedestrian video data that we're collecting uh, with uh, grid smart cameras at each of the four mid block uh, crosswalks. So all told, we have more than 70 terabytes of data that has been collected since 2012. This data continues to grow and evolve. And uh, the take home message is we have plenty of data if you're interested in, in doing any kind of analysis. The Ann Arbor Connected Environment will serve as the foundation for the Smart, in, 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 uh, smart Intersection project that we just kicked off about a month ago. Um, Dr. Henry Liu and Dr. Jim Sayer will be leading this project. And we've assembled a stellar team of both public and private partners. We're very excited about this next step. The project goal is to accelerate CAV deployments in a nutshell. And uh, we, we, we plan to demonstrate the benefits to early adopters for connected vehicles. For example, there is a suite of safety warnings as well as green wave speed advisory. Two transportation agencies will demonstrate a benefit with us, transit signal priority and emergency vehicle preemption, as well as vulnerable road user notification. And as I know we are all aware that pedestrian fatalities, cyclist fatalities are on the rise uh, in the US and around the world. This project will also demonstrate the potential of roadside sensing for cooperative driving. It will demonstrate the feasibility for infrastructure investments and we will provide a roadmap with infrastructure supported CAV de deployments so that other mun municipalities, state and local agencies will be able to also accelerate the 
deployment of CAVs in their regions. At each of the 21 smart intersections, um, we will be generating proxy BSMs as well as sensor data sharing messages. And these intersections will broadcast both proxy BSMs and SDSMs using both CV to X and DSRC technologies. The vehicles uh, that are currently deployed, about half of them will continue into this new project. We will also deploy um, vehicles with um, CV to X OBUs on board and the vehicles and infrastructure will interact in this connected environment. And as I mentioned, we will develop an implementation guide so that we'll provide tools to others to build a self-sustainable CAV ecosystem. And then finally, uh, we'll create an advanced V2X technology living lab in Ann Arbor. And at three of these intersections, uh, we'll deploy 5G new radios, as well as um, there'll be sensor data sharing for AVs that will enable future application development. We're very excited about this next chapter, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share the work we're doing in Ann Arbor with you. Thank you. Um, so uh, next we have uh, David Clifford. David uh, is the head of strategic uh, innovation at CAMNU. In his role, he focuses on improving technology readiness of roads and road operators with a focus on enabling future autonomous mobility while improving roads for all users. Additionally, he leads development of machine learning al algorithms that uh, enable predictive and proactive approaches to road safety and maintenance. So uh, let's go and uh, look at what David has to offer to us. Thank you. Morning, um, Morning. and good afternoon. So I recently joined Cap Avenue, um, where we're really excited to talk and work on uh, several projects, including a project here in Michigan, where we're uh, working with the Michigan DOT to create a corridor between downtown Detroit and Ann Arbor that enables road users to get up-to-date information about what's on the road ahead of them throughout that corridor through a distributed sensor network. Um, and why are we doing this? So. <clears throat> Today, there's a number of concepts in connected and autonomous vehicles that have to do with the ability to get data from infrastructure or to get data from other vehicles that are on the road. And you can look at projects like John's project in Macomb County and Mary Lynn's project, and you can start to see this tapestry emerge, right? You can see these different projects that are regional and Mary Lynn, you know, you described the ability to uh, federate the learning that you're collecting in Ann Arbor two municipalities over time. But at Cavenue, we think that that future is pretty, is fairly adjacent, right? There's a implementation and integration challenge to think about bringing these technologies together and deploying them in a way where we can provide information to all of those different road users that uh, want access to up-to-date and meaningful information about the road ahead of them. We see this tremendous opportunity in doing this to simplify the operational design domain that these autonomous vehicles and automated driving concepts work in. Um, before I came to Cavenue, I was at General Motors. And at General Motors, we have a very, very large connected fleet of vehicles. And we were able to um, get insight about how those vehicles were used across roads across the United States. And we had, have, had, ugh, have, they have, we had, an incredibly active uh, mapping program, an incredibly active data collection program. And what you find when you're involved in the world of mapping is that the only thing that's true when you go from municipality to municipality to municipality or county to county to county is the amount of variation there is. Um, my colleagues who are in traffic engineering like John Abraham would point out to you the differences in the way that traffic lights are hung at different places in Macomb County. We could talk about the differences in the way that traffic intersections are configured, um, the differences in striping, 
And there is a lot of simplification of that built environment that can be done to enable safer roads for everyone, and especially more predictable roads for users of autonomous vehicles. And that's a lot of what Cavani looks at bringing to the table is looking at how modifications to the built environment can enable these autonomous vehicle concepts. You know, John and Mary Lynn both talked about massive amounts of data. And when you look at the connected vehicle data of the future, you can see not just gigabytes, but petabytes of data being produced by different connected autonomous ve automated vehicle concepts. And one of the challenges that you run into is that that data is really only valuable if that data informs the next person who's coming further down the road after you. Uh, this is kind of a canary in the coal mine problem. And you run into this a lot when you look at these deployments at, at scale, at the scale of millions of miles of surface road in the United States. And we think at Cavenue that we need to pivot from uh, cars that describe roads to roads that inform cars, which is why I'm very glad to be on this panel with people like John and Mary Lynn uh, to think about the role that infrastructure operators have in being able to federate that data back out to OEMs. Historically, we've thought about this as a handshake between the roadside unit and the vehicle, something like DSRC or you know, 5G that creates that connection with the vehicle itself. And at Cavenue, we're thinking about this a little bit differently, where we're trying to think about how we can take advantage of the systems that any road user would have, right? For the case of a person in a level zero car or a pedestrian or a cyclist, these are their eyes. For a level two car or a level four car, these are the sensors on the vehicle. And how can we use uh, information across the corridor to broadcast data back in a way that the sensors on the vehicle, the native sensors can pick up that information so that we don't have to introduce a new component to the electrical architecture of the vehicle or we don't have to rely on the adoption of a new component on the electrical architecture of the vehicle itself. At the same time, we're looking at how to partner with OEMs to get the data from the road back to the OEMs or back to application developers in the navigation world. Um, we think that this kind of dual use strategy is a beneficial one because it allows everyone, to, every road operator, every user of the road to have the opportunity to get that shared and rich data about what's on the road ahead. Um, from a personal standpoint, I guess I'd say that some of the worst accidents in my life have been on lonely roads. Um, I can remember driving back from Richmond, Virginia to Washington, D.C. on a very snowy night where the Virginia uh, highway team didn't have the chance to plow the road uh, to the degree I was ahead of the snow plows. And when you're ahead of the snow plows, you're in kind of a dangerous situation and you don't know what's on the road ahead. Lesson learned, I don't drive ahead of snow plows anymore. But we need to think about ways to make sure that that information about icy road, about hazards on the road is really available to all users and that, that, that the complete corridor gets described um, in a digital fashion or in a digital twin fashion to be able to give that data back to users. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we're a growing team. Um, and if you have an interest specifically in the machine learning part of this or in data science concepts that are applied to mobility, we'd encourage you to think about coming and joining us here at Cavenue. Thank you. So uh, next we have all the way from Australia, um, Rita Excel. Uh, so uh, by the way, it's uh, I think uh, just past 1 a.m. there in, uh, in Australia, I guess, Rita. Uh, Rita serves as the executive director for, of Australia and New Zealand Driverless Vehicle Initiative where she is responsible for delivering uh, the safe and successful introduction of driverless vehicle technologies into Australia and to New Zealand. And uh, she uh, remains the technical leader for the Australian Road Research Board's South Australian office, where she oversees a team of senior researchers working across a wide range of transportation related uh, projects. So uh, without doing much, let's hear from Rita. Thanks very much, John, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, it is early in the morning or uh, late in the evening, whichever way you want to have it. But thanks very much for the opportunity. And um, I acknowledge that I'm here uh, representing Blades Australia, which um, is a, an industry sector partner 
construction industry. Um, so they've um, they invited me to participate on their behalf. Um, so I hope you can see my screen. Um, and um, so Abby, who are we and what do we do? Um, it, you know, our vision is to uh, safely introduce this technology onto the roads and the presentation I'll do very quickly will tell you what's happening in Australia um, but also focus on one of the things that we're very proud of and, and that we run the largest representative uh, public um, attitude survey in relation to acceptance of driverless vehicle technology but we've extended that to shared vehicles and also uh, looking at impacts this year around COVID and what impacts that might have on public transit uh, and use of shared vehicles. So um, who shares that vision? I hope you can see this is our uh, hero shot, uh, over 150 partners across uh, government, uh, industry research and, and startups. We also have some international um, members, uh, some organizations represented here uh, today, uh, including TRL, and um, a number of US-based organizations. So essentially the collaboration is really about bringing together like-minded organizations, like-minded individuals and connecting them to each other to develop and, and progress the introduction of connected and automated vehicle technology. So in Australia, like globally, around 2014 in Australia, um, it was acknowledged it was time for a reset um, that uh, our transport system was going to be changing and needed to change. Uh, our road toll in Australia based on per capita cap population. Um, so we kill about 33, sorry, we kill about 1200 people per annum and on a population base of uh, 25 million, um, that's pretty significant. But we also uh, catastrophically injure about 35,000 people as well annually. So from an Australian perspective, there's something wrong with our transport system that does that. So um, ADVI was started in 2015 and our focus is primarily to ensure that we get all the pillars of connectivity shared and low and zero emission vehicles in place ahead of the deployment of fully automated uh, vehicles onto our network. So this is a map of the activity in Australia and New Zealand. And um, primarily this map shows that there's activity right across Australia and New Zealand, and there's in multiple areas. And I'll talk to you about some projects and major projects that we're running around the connected and automated vehicle space and look at some companies um, that are developing uh, technology in Australia. And I think, you know, what we've noticed in Australia out of COVID is that um, reliance on internet uh, supply chains uh, were, you know, completely broken. And so there's been quite a strong emphasis on uh, building and recognising onshore capability. So in Australia, they're um, probably like the rest of the world, but primarily in Australia, we have two um, key use cases. Those are, um, you know, we may call them off-road. Uh, and when we talk about off-road, we talk about unsealed roads and that makes up most of the road network across Australia out of our major cities. And then we talk about the, the deployment of this technology in the cities. Um, so in the cities, uh, we see the road agencies taking quite a, a, a big lead on that. Um, as well as supported by industry and on the off-road use cases are more commercial industrial applications and our mining sector has taken a big lead on that but um, similarly our ports and automation of ports. So you know what's been happening um, since 2015 when we uh, were established I'm pleased to say that um, we have got an exchange with Michigan there's a Michigan and Australia uh, exchange around ITS uh, technology and we have regular webinars and, and that's uh, our minister came over and visited Ann Arbor and was uh, very uh, excited by it and we signed up a few years ago to an exchange with Michigan. Uh, but there's some major Australian New Zealand companies that have been working globally, um, developing uh, connected technology and also connect, building new vehicle platforms uh, that uh, are the future transport mobility, particularly for um, low speed vehicles. And we've got an image of two of those there, um, the AV vehicle, uh, which is a, a vehicle platform 
and also the Omeo shuttle, which is um, akin to the low speed shuttles that you would be familiar with. Um, around the test beds, I mentioned and talked about test beds. So um, uh, I really can't do it justice. These test beds have been established for many years and they're world leading in the uh, technology that they're deploying. Um, but um, we have run a webinar series. And if you go to our website um, and go to Adby Connect, and you can hear from the professionals, um, but Professor, Professor Majid Sabi from the Melbourne University set up the Ames test bed uh, in 2016. It's an integrated multimodal ecosystem. It has public transport, uh, heavy freight, and also trams. Uh, running thread and light passenger vehicles as well. Uh, so it's about 3.7 uh, square miles or six square kilometres in Australian um, terminology. And, um, and there is multiple layers of connectivity. It is a test bed, so um, uh, industry partners are invited to and test, as well as university as um, PhDs and, and research partners around that. Um, the oldest on-road uh, connected vehicle um, trial or test bed is located in New South Wales in, a, in the Illawarra region of New South Wales. Um, it's been running since 2012 um, and um, it looked to work with heavy vehicles. Um, it was addressing trying to uh, provide warnings to heavy vehicles around steep descent primarily. Um, and there's a number of warning signals that go to the heavy vehicles. But since 2012, um, it's been expanded to roadside units around um, the, the key routes. It also goes into buses now, into light vehicles um, and a range of other uh, public transport facilities. So that's really been informing um, the, the vision for transport for New South Wales to um, become you know, a world leader in, in how they manage their transport network and how they improve the journeys for their, um, for their um, citizens and for their community. And about two weeks ago, uh, the Future Transport Technology Roadmap was released by Transport for New South Wales. So you can go to their website uh, to put that out to have a look at that. So um, um, the Ipswich Connected Vehicle Trial is another trial that's run. It's just starting off. It's had a little bit of a, um, a slower start because of COVID. That's 500 um, uh, participants from the public, from the community in a, um, in a city called Ipswich. And it's using um, Coda Wireless Technology, which is the, the company in the top corner, um, and looking at sending messages um, to the vehicles and, and different warnings. So this is, um, you know, the largest um, connected vehicle trial using uh, private uh, vehicles. So off-road, uh, anybody who hears of Australia and, look, and looks up automation would definitely be drawn to the mining sector here and, and the automation of the mining sites. Um, there's a lot that's been reported about the automation of the uh, large um, haul trucks, but recently um, one of our mining uh, partners announced that they're sort of looking at uh, working with Ford um, and other companies around automating level four vehicles so that um, they want for safety reasons not to have any human driving uh, on their mine sites. Um, and this not only increases productivity, uh, but also addresses some of the safety issues. Um, so there's, you know, safety um, on mine sites is quite well controlled. Um, and uh, uh, essentially when we talk to some of the mining partners, the biggest issue for them now is drive to and from the mine sites to their, um, to their, their rest uh, where they're going to stay. Um, so that's about the issue of on-road um, and how we get safety on-road from between mine sites. We're not going to be talking about drones too much today, I don't think, but I don't think it's remiss of me to not say that, you know, as far as automated um, drone delivery for medical supplies is something that we're working with our Civil Aviation Authority around, you know, addressing some of their line of sight rulings around operation of drones that we have in Australia 
and identifying use cases where that can have some benefits as far as deployment of drones and there's a lot of activity in that regard. Um, we've uh, had one of our other mining partner companies um, automate a, a train um, and that's been a project, significant investment from industry. Uh, it's been um, um, uh, taken longer than was expected, but uh, at last report, it has delivered the benefits, significant benefits. So I think what we learned from industry is that if there is a commercial reason to deploy this technology, that the investment and the return on investment is probably a focus of theirs. And uh, automation is delivering high returns on investment uh, in uh, particular industry sectors. And um, ports uh, are another area of focus and also the, the sort of first mile, last mile in and out of ports and the automation of ports is something that is um, being led primarily by uh, the commercial sector. So I suppose what I'm saying is sort of the on-road deployment of uh, connected vehicles and trials is being sort of led by governments and then off-road is being led by the commercial industry uh, sector and investment is significant from both. But the big issue is public acceptance. And that's something I think that we all are dealing with, trying to understand how we gauge uh, awareness and understanding uh, when most people have not had any experience with the technology that we're trying to ask them what they think about. Uh, but um, irrespective of that, we need to have some baseline understanding of whether the work that we're all doing collectively um, is having an impact if it's cutting through. And so we run, uh, as I said, a national national public acceptance survey. It's the only scientific survey that's run um, uh, from a national representation. Um, and it looks at, as most surveys would, uh, 18 uh, year olds plus. So what we looked at was, you know, we're, we're trying to develop this technology and the people that are gonna be probably first users of this technology are not currently driving today. Um, and they probably haven't considered driving yet and we don't really know what their perceptions are or how they're getting their information. So we've actually asked um, this cohort, 13 and 15 year olds, um, and we found that there was no real scientific, published scientific uh, uh, reports on surveying of these people. Um, so we used an ethics approval process. We used um, social media platforms and traditional ways of collecting data from this cohort. Um, so why is it important that capturing these um, people, uh, young people, it's because obviously they're our future road users, but more importantly is that they're the high risk group that we're trying, you know, really to address uh, in relation to the safety benefits of this technology. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, what we found was uh, that their views don't differ very much from um, their older people uh, and experienced drivers. So um, there was a lot of um, hypothesis that uh, young people would be uh, eager adopters of this technology. What we're finding is that um, they have very, uh, very similar and aligned views. And whether this is in relation to their lack of exposure to the technology and therefore their um, uh, concerns or otherwise are related to that. Um, but, you know, we, we are not, if we expect young people coming through to use the technology without any concerns, well then um, we're, we're mistaken. Um, so there's, you know, a bit of work to be done there. So thanks very much. And I look forward to being part of the panel. Thank you, Rita. Uh, next we have Jeff Hood. Uh, he's a, a principal at uh, Deloitte uh, Consulting and leads the firm's connected and autonomous uh, vehicle offering. Focuses on um, on commerce, commercialization strategy, lifecycle development, and in-use optimization. And uh, he's also responsible for Deloitte's cloud business and Alliance's development across across the automotive and transportation markets. Uh, he earn, earned uh, several degrees from University of Michigan, uh, MBA from the Ross uh, Business School, uh, MS and BS from uh, uh, the Engineering School at University of Michigan also. And it's, uh, it will be interesting also to see or hear about the commercial, commercial uh, aspect of this whole technology and uh, take it away, Jeff. Thank you very much, John, and uh, thanks to all of you for the opportunity to speak with you about a US DOT automated driving system deployment that's planned for the city of Detroit in uh, greater Southeast Michigan. Um, 
as the left side of this cover page indicates, big focus around safety data and collaboration in this initiative. And like uh, many of my colleagues who previously presented, uh, our overarching objective for USTOT is to help accelerate the commercialization of safe deployment of automated driving vehicles. A little bit of background on this one. Um, it was back 2018, 2019 when USDOT ran uh, notice a funding opportunity using a funding pool of about $60 million. Uh, it was in September, 2019, they announced the winners and of the 73 applicants, there were seven awardees that are shown here. Um, the name of our team uh, was uh, called the Michigan Mobility Collaborative and the deployment target city uh, for live road demonstrations uh, is the city of Detroit, although a lot of the testing will be done in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti at some of the test tracks, as you'll see here in just a bit. Um, John asked us to comment on the SAE levels. What, this is a focus around level three, four uh, automation. From a, a participant standpoint, you can see we're leveraging a lot of the assets and of the mobility ecosystem around Southeast Michigan. It's really a nice blend of public and private participation on this team. Uh, Delight is playing the role of program management and also um, uh, advising on the cloud technologies for managing the data. You, know, you can see all the different roles that are planned here, uh, heavy engagement through the city of Detroit with the citizens, um, M City from the University of Michigan, as well as the Transportation Research Institute will do a lot of the heavy lifting as it relates to safety and data management. Uh, we'll also leverage the American Center for Mobility, a 500 acre uh, testing validation center in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and several other participants, including Ford Motor Company, who's gonna focus around collecting the ethnographic research to help us really fine tune the use case that'll be used for this deployment. So some of the overarching uh, objectives, a little more detail on those. I mentioned a big focus around safety data and collaboration. And certainly we all know that AVs offer the potential for a safer, more equitable transportation experience. And in fact, the, the very use case that we based our proposal on was focused around uh, seniors in Detroit that don't have access to uh, transportation because they don't have personal mobility and they live in you know what we would call an area where there's been a market failure as it relates to transportation uh, and you know they need access obviously to medical supplies doctor visits as well as grocery and so there, because there's just this tremendous gap between technology and you know you know citizen attitudes on AVs you know, we're putting this program together to really help close that gap. gap. So from a safety standpoint, uh, we're, the program is really designed to demonstrate the reliable and reusable methodology that can be used to test vehicles to mitigate risk before they hit the live roads. We'll talk a little further about safety, but the signature methodology that we're starting with is uh, developed by M-City since 2018, this ABC method that we'll highlight here in a little bit. Also a big focus around data collection uh, from the vehicle uh, data collection unit, but also the infrastructure. Uh, and then there's an early deployment of a Verizon 5G infrastructure that will be leveraged as well, both at the test facilities uh, as well, potentially as in the city. Um, and from a collaboration standpoint, there's heavy citizen engagement that's planned, particularly with the seniors that live in the city to collect ethnographic research around what their user needs are and try to capture the attitudes and beliefs around uh, experiencing automated vehicles. From a timeline standpoint, it's a four-year program. Um, and you can see on this slide that we start off with in year one with mobilization uh, of the overall project. And we're gonna develop a very detailed uh, work plan that we owe the US Department of Transportation. Um, we're gonna start with our citizen engagement plan uh, as well as uh, in the year first year, we're gonna actually run a competitive process, a request for proposal for the AV platform. And this was a bit of a unique approach, uh, I think relative to the other uh, proposals or applicants for the grant, because uh, we, we saw the technology was changing so fast that we didn't wanna to commit too early to an AV technology. And so uh, we're gonna run a procurement process to select the appropriate partner 
based on the needs of the people in the city and the use case that's identified. Um, in latter years, we'll start off with a lot of the lab testing and track testing youth years in two and three. And you know, certainly by year four, we'll be on the public roads doing testing and delivering some utility to the citizens in the city of Detroit. I'd expect the overall process will be a lot more agile than what's shown here. This is just the kind of the big chunks of in phases of effort, you know, over the four year period. Take a look at how we organize so at the very top, you know, we show our program office and interaction with our sponsors and advisors along the various in areas of interest of safety data and collaboration. Um, I mentioned uh, delightfully managing our program office. And then we have our three major work streams that are co-staff with the blend of resources from the constituents I just showed. Um, but also to highlight in this diagram, the partners and the users that uh, we plan to have involved uh, in this in include a number of people from the city of Detroit, including um, grocery stores like Meyer, um, senior centers, uh, people who will be engaged to help with safety driving, drop off and pick up to facilitate the entire process. So this is the simple way that we had organized our team. As it relates to safety, I mentioned the ABC process. Many of you are probably familiar with it, but if you're not, uh, I mentioned a, a process that was developed by uh, M City and the University of Michigan, uh, really designed to really uh, help identify and mitigate a lot of the risk early. And so it's at the A, accelerate the evaluation, covering a number of the scenarios that uh, we experience that constitute the majority of driving conditions and crashes be uh, modeling and experiencing and measuring the behavior of the driving uh, and the AV platform. And then see uh, really analyzing and in throwing a number of challenges at the vehicle using edge cases or corner cases as they're called in this case. Let me just highlight data. Um, you know, for this discussion, I think you know, probably just point out that our, our intent is to develop a, a very sophisticated data collection system, likely with one of the hyperscalers either AWS or Google Cloud or uh, Microsoft Azure um, so that we can ingest the data both in streaming as well as in batch in order to organize the data in a format that can be accessed by all of the users, uh, namely the US Department of uh, Transportation. And we've already designed the architecture and launched and tested um, the actual uh, data collection unit on a number of different uh, systems that are provided by those hyperscalers. Finally, a little bit about the collaboration approach. You know, at the end of the day, uh, USDOT is looking to us to deliver uh, ultimately a playbook of how to launch uh, AVs in cities and, and in terms of how to develop this methodology and work with the citizens of the city of Detroit. And part of the approach will include leveraging some existing research that's already been done on the market, namely a mobility index that uh, our firm had done uh, but other ethnographic research that Ford and others have uh, on the local market there to address that market failure I mentioned for seniors and the disabled. And then secondly, this work stream will conduct a, a process to identify the ADS fleet that'll be used over, over time. I mentioned through that uh, procurement process and over time engage with the citizens to co continuously uh, check their pulse and um, their attitudes and beliefs regarding autonomous vehicles. So that's it, that's all I had to share today. I hope this was insightful and uh, shares our plans with what um, this, this nice team will kick off. But the city of Detroit uh, City Council has just approved uh, the deployment to kick off here this spring. So we were delayed because of COVID by about a year, uh, but now we're happy to get this moving. John, back over to you. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, last but not the least, uh, at the end of his work day from uh, London, UK, James Long, uh, is a transport technology and strategy specialist with more than 13 years of consultancy experience in the specification, implementation, acceptance, and assessment of intelligent transportation systems and new mobility modes. Uh, James was a solutions architect for Smart Mobility Living Lab in London, a real world test bed for new modes of mobility in a complex urban environment. Today, he uh, is the head of technical consulting and he works with 
automotive tier one manufacturers, uh, technology providers, insurers, and others to deliver R&D programs in a complex urban environment. So uh, let's go to uh, James in London. Thanks very much, John. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, I suppose, for you as well, Rita. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to take part in this. Um, given the time, I'll try and move swiftly through this, and particularly because John's just done a lovely introduction, which covers off the first slide. So the Smart Mobility Living Lab, um, is, as we said, it's a real world test facility. This was established in September last year uh, after a kind of three year build phase where we had uh, a series of industry and uh, government fundings so working with partners like Cisco and uh, Transport for London, Cubic amongst others to get the facility established. And um, what we're now working with as a commercial facility is, uh, is a range of different organizations, just public and private, uh, to enable the development and testing of new technologies, services, vehicles in, in seriously challenging urban conditions. So Smart Mobility Living Lab is, is part of the TRL groups as the Transport Research Laboratory. Um, interestingly, I discovered that, that Dave Clifford from Cavenu actually did his thesis talking about TRL, which I was fascinated by. <laughs> so it shows that there might be a few of you out there who are aware of our organization. Um, we've had a very, very long history in the transport sector, um, having started life in the 1930s, uh, got privatized about 30 years ago. Um, but in fact, we've been working with automated vehicles as early as the 1960s. Um, and if we have 10 seconds at the end, I'll show you a very, very short clip. It's bizarre and wonderful, but I think it really just shows everything here is about timing. Um, when is the right time with the right conditions start to introduce these services? So on the left side of this screen um, demonstrates that we are part of a wider network of test facilities. So this is called CAM Testbed UK, so it connects and automated mobility. And uh, we're one of seven different centres, so there's a mix of controlled road environments like Millbrook, um, kind of semi-controlled environments uh, like, um, like Cullum Science Park, for example, and ourselves in, in urban environments on public real roads. So our test facility is split across two sites. One is north of the river in London um, at the former Olympic Park site uh, up in Stratford. And then south of the river, we're in the Royal Borough of Greenwich. These routes were very, very deliberately um, located and chosen uh, to make sure that we could not just look at the technologies involved, but fundamentally the impact that they have on people and the places where they're being deployed. So as an organization, so TRL has a, a very, very strong safety heritage. And from the starting point, we started to think about the uh, requirements, the needs from both an infrastructure capability, the, the developmental state and so on of new vehicles and technologies, as well as the complexity of the environments that were going to be deployed in these uh, two parts of our routes. So we've got 24 kilometers worth of routes. Everything's in kilometers for me. It makes my maths easier uh, when I'm looking at camera ranges and Wi-Fi ranges and so on. But we've got a range of different uh, environments that we can operate in. Lots of different road types, everything up to 50 miles an hour, down to five mile an hour residential. We've got large stadiums when we're actually allowed to go to places like that. We've got big mobility centers, uh, town center environments and so on. So it gives the perfect opportunity to look at a blend of different environments. Across those 24 kilometers, because these are all public roads, um, we're able to control things in a very limited way. So what we focused upon is in instrumenting those parts of the network with um, high speed connectivity, making sure we've got monitoring infrastructure um, and then also infrastructure and sensors so that we can actually work with the vehicles in a cooperative infrastructure sense. I'll talk more about that in just a second. So each of those yellow pins is effectively a location where we have our monitoring infrastructure. It's been very, very deliberately chosen. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, there was a full range of features covered um, so certain things are going to be clustered around different points, so different intersection types, for example, but also some of the more unusual and sort of anachronistic locations that are typical of UK roads, places like mini roundabouts, where, quite frankly, we as drivers don't behave properly. We drive over the top of them, we drive the wrong way around them, um, and anyone seeking to try and deploy services into these sorts of environments has a fundamental need to understand and validate performance uh, in relation to those features and build understanding of how they, um, they impact driving styles. So what have we physically built? Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, we've got a lamppost. A lot of our equipment is located eight to 10 meters up lamppost, making sure that we're not impacting too greatly on the streetscape. 
We don't want to start to induce different behaviors, um, but we also want to have it there to observe, get the greatest view that we can possible. So we've installed nearly 300 um, high definition cameras across the network. They're infrared, so they can work night and day. Uh, we've focused these around particular parts of the network. The reason we've chosen cameras is very, very particular. We wanted the uh, to not understand just what happened to a vehicle, but why did it happen? So what's the context around a particular event? We've also installed a variety of other sensors. Um, we've installed about 40 of our intersections with V2X technologies. Uh, Rita, you'll be thrilled to hear that they're from Coda Wireless. So we're, we're um, representing our friends in, uh, on the other side of the world to us. We've also put in a wide scale um, mesh network so that we can both do backhaul for our own systems, but also support the operation of vehicles on the ground. All of this gets taken back to our own data centers and our data hubs, uh, which we have located on our routes using a private fiber backhaul. Um, it's not nearly as impressive as the size and scale of John's uh, control center. However, we do have a couple of control rooms ourselves so we can manage and operate those trials, um, do remote operations and so on um, as we go along. Uh, in addition to these, we've also invested in um, our own open architecture, automated vehicles, so they're, they're level four capable. Um, we did this not because we want to be a developer, um, but because we're working with clients who want to understand the breadth of data that starts to be generated. We wanted to work on have a platform where we can start to work with clients who want to test out a new sensor or, or algorithm and integrate that within the vehicle. So we have a couple of those that we've uh, instrumented and put open architecture uh, autoware solutions on. So as well as the physical conditions, I'm very sorry if this video is playing and making anyone feel seasick, but we've also invested heavily in our, our digital infrastructure. Um, we know that simulation is a fundamental part of how organizations are developing, particularly prior to coming to a new geography. So we've taken great lengths to make sure that we have the most representative model. And not only does it physically um, link to the real world, but we also have um, all of the data that we can capture that can be directly um, associated with that model. So we can look at real world scenarios, we can identify different events, different corner cases, edge cases uh, that are occurring on and around our routes to help users understand local behaviours, local driving styles. We've done some really interesting projects recently um, through uh, Zenzik, um, which are the operation who, who manage the um, overall CAM testbed UK working with people like Millbrook, working with Midlands Future Mobility, other two test beds in the UK to do distributed simulation. Um, and this was one of the elements that we brought to the party around our digital environment. So I've mentioned around the digital twin, just a few examples of some of the projects we're undertaking at the moment. We've uh, worked with our innovation communities. We've got lots of different corporate members, um, private institutions, but also a huge number of startups uh, where we've worked with them to start to deploy level four trials uh, on public roads in London. So they're all taking different things from that experiment, but it was, um, it was a really worthwhile exercise. We've very recently just concluded a few days ago, um, a couple of projects with some startups who are really trying to understand the performance of their systems in really, really challenging environments. So fortunately, um, where we are, we've got lots and lots of high sided buildings. We've got some brutal tunnels. We've got some dense residential environments, which are just ideal for looking at things like GNSS performance and understanding how that starts to come together. Um, but more than just using our infrastructure for monitoring, we're using it as a fundamental part of um, vehicle systems. So we're doing a project with major OEM at the moment, which is looking at taking a systems view of how you start to utilize the roadside infrastructure for, for perception, for making certain amounts of decision making, ultimately using that as an off-board sensor for the vehicle. I'm going to skip forward to take a slightly broader UK view just for, for one slide, um, just explain a little bit about what we're doing from a regulatory standpoint. So the UK has taken quite, um, quite a progressive stance when it's thinking about regulation for new forms of mobility, particularly around connected and automated. So a couple of years ago, there was an Automated Electric Vehicle Act, which, was, um, which took account of a range of different things, but fundamentally made sure that there was an insurance basis for addressing any liabilities with new technology. For a number of years now, we've had the code of practice for CAV testing, um, which means that you can start to have safety drivers in the vehicle, um, but it means that a lot of those systems uh, can be out on the roads um, undertaking testing in a, in a responsible way. There are major initiatives at the moment also looking at the safety and cybersecurity aspects around um, CAVs, that's called CAV Pass. And there's been a, a multi-year review now um, by the Law Commission thinking about what 
legislation needs to change around the longer term deployment for level four vehicles. Um, and that's just concluded its third consultation, so should be um, getting some results very, very soon. Uh, the, the final thing to mention here is that there's been a, a, a later this year, there will be a, um, a project undertaken by the Department for Transport in the UK, which is looking towards the approval uh, and regulation around um, firstly novel vehicles around pods and shuttles, uh, but that potentially uses the benchmark for how we start to regulate and certify uh, new forms of automated vehicle in the UK. Just very quickly, there's been a lot of public investment, public and private sector investment over the last few years. So we've had about 90 projects launched and funded to the tune of about half a billion pounds. Um, covers a mix of different categories. We've covered the obvious ones already around automation and connectivity, but also looking around simulation and connected plant uh, also. I've mentioned around Chemtest, but UK. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the next slide, but if you have any questions um, more widely about particular projects underway, both within the UK, but also within Smart Mobility Living Lab, then please get in touch. And very finally, this is a Citroen from the 1960s, which was uh, instrumented. This is used on our track. It's the classic person hanging out the window. Um, this was a very, very long time ago, but it was all a system really looking at how you start to operate vehicles in foggy conditions. Now, questioning whether you should actually be putting automated vehicles in foggy conditions so it can drive at usual speeds when everyone else at that time was driving very, very slowly. But it just shows the heritage uh, that was there. This ended up doing about 14 kilometers worth of network uh, with a kind of wire mesh. But anyway, I thought I'd leave, leave you on that particular note. Really looking forward to a few questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, I do apologize that we have gone over uh, the time limit already, but uh, the organizers have extended us uh, time till 12. Uh, that's another uh, maybe 12 to 13 minutes of question and answers. Uh, so we do have some questions that came through uh, in, in the chat boxes. And we do have some prepared questions too. Uh, one of the first questions I had was, you know, uh, coming from the uh, previous session, uh, we had a congressman talking and everybody else, we all talk about safety. Safety as the major objective behind CAV technologies. And so uh, what are some of the metrics that you all have used? And I can start with uh, our own experience in, in Macomb County. Uh, one of the things that, of course, you know, when it comes to safety, it's um, how many uh, fatal crashes, how many uh, other crashes, uh, have we reduced as a part of safety? Those are some of the metrics that we use. And uh, since most of our projects have been pilots, we haven't had uh, any real world data to, to really measure uh, the, the, the effectiveness of uh, connected and automated vehicles, though we do have an anecdotal uh, kind of a, um, excerpt from one of our uh, captains of a fire department, which is using uh, uh, our um, um, you know uh, preemption uh, technology using uh, connected vehicle technology and they said uh, it shaved off 52 seconds off their uh, response time which uh, he believes uh, the patient that they were going to attend to uh, survived because of those 52 seconds so that's just an anecdotal i was uh, wondering if anybody else in the panel had any experiences with metrics for measuring the effectiveness of cav technologies Hey, John, I can make a comment. Of course, this is mainly based on our plans as opposed to the deployment results, but uh, our plans are to focus around sensor degradation and um, really monitoring that uh, both for infrastructure as well as vehicle sensor degradation as it relates to impacts from the environment or other factors that may uh, impact driving conditions of the vehicle and therefore how sensors um, perceive uh, the road conditions. All right, James. Jeff, uh, so uh, Marilyn, uh, do you have any experience from uh, the research point of view on any of the safety pilot projects? We, um, because uh, again, the penetration is the issue, right? Even at the height of um, rush hour, we're looking at two to 3% penetration of connected vehicles during our deployment. So we don't, we haven't really done um, an analysis of crash reduction or those kinds of, uh, of things. Again, anecdotally, anecdotally, we have had people come back 
um, and report those that have HMIs in their vehicles, they did get a timely forward crash warning, for example. Um, Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, may I, may I come in on that? So um, this is something which is being looked at uh, in the UK at the moment. And up to this point, there's been a, a much stronger view towards kind of reactions to particular incidents. Um, but with automated vehicles and particularly the range of sensors on, on board those vehicles, it presents more of an opportunity around in-service monitoring. So how do you start to identify um, behaviours, characteristics within the wider fleet that start to uh, effectively preempt particular behaviours. So looking at things like harsh braking events, um, identifying those behaviours coming from other connected vehicles or unconnected vehicles. Uh, and that falls into two areas. One is both, how do you start to build a development log? Um, so you've seen it in other industries with aviation, for example, where there's uh, logs around identifying incidents and how you start to use that for everyone to uplift, uh, but also the potential then to bring it through to look at different hotspots and um, potentially looking at some of Dave's infrastructure in the future. How do you start to identify and simplify the ODD in those particular locations? So in service monitoring, it's, um, it's a, a major topic for, for review and uh, development. All right. Very good. Um, there was a question uh, on the chat box about, I, mean, I had mentioned in my presentation, even Amir Lin uh, mentioned the dual units for DSRC and uh, CB2X. Uh, the question was basically if both can simultaneously start broadcasting and we can, if we can use it. Uh, we are still in the infancy of changing over to this dual units at the moment. My understanding is that it, it would be either CB2X or DSRC. Uh, but it will have both radios and both antennas, but uh, it's, it's kind of a toggle uh, kind of situation. But um, uh, Marilyn, um, with your experience with the dual units, uh, can they do both DSRC and CV2X at the same time so that vehicles coming along with the right technology can you know, make use of the the, the well, there are some, um, we are, we have not, um, well, that is what we proposed. We oh. are waiting to see the FCC's um, ruling um, because it, in some sense, um, it would make sense for us to um, deploy a dual because we have a year of planning. So we're waiting to see, we have not deployed dual, though that is what we proposed. Okay. Anybody else have experience with uh, roadside units with uh, dual technology? I didn't hear anything uh, from anybody else. So we'll go on to the next question. Uh, there's a massive question that uh, most of us could contribute to, which is uh, how do CAV services become a commercial reality? And I, I think I heard from one or two people today about uh, the commercialization. Um, so how, when, are, when will all this become a commercial uh, reality? Um, maybe we can start with um, uh, David or... So one of the challenges I think in this space is determining who the, when you've got a commercial product, right? When you're trying to enter into a commercial product or create a commercial reality, one of the questions is who's the consumer of that product? And um, safer roads are something where the road users consume the product and then there's a secondary question, which is who uh, pays for that product? And in the connected autonomous vehicle infrastructure discussion, this is a challenge. This is definitely a challenge. I think um, at the research and pilot stage, who pays for the product is relatively obvious. It's people who, pay, who fund research, right? At the broader adoption phase, this is an area where you, know, you have to be creative, right? And I think one of the good things about um, Cavenue is that we look at uh, creating markets for safer roads, not just creating product solutions for those roads um, and working with, I think as many different organizations as we can to figure out what that right fit is for commercialization of the technology. I think one of the other benefits that we have at this point in time is a lot of the risk in some of these systems um, the sort of commercial supply chain for sensors, for silicon, for things that are safer and allow us to operate safer roads, a lot of that supply chain has been strengthened over the investments that the automotive industry has made with regards to 
you know, sensors that can really live the test of time. So I think that, you know, some, some of the parts of commercialization here uh, from the supply chain side have been, I think, relatively well rationalized. I think from the demand side, you know, again, it, it takes a lot of creativity to figure out how to cross what, what we would call, I think, in advanced research and technology, that valley of death. Um, prior to joining General Motors, I worked at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And there you have a lot of really great ideas that are research grade ideas where you look and try and figure out how to implement those things in practice in ways where they change uh, people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. My perspective and the reason I came to Cavenu is I think that the ability for us to take that technology into practice shouldn't take four years. It needs to really take rational partners to be able to um, bring this technology to life and I think there's a, a number of different ways to do that. And uh, some of them will be maybe on the panel next year when we talk about some of the different ways we've been bringing these technologies into, into commercial reality. Very true, very true. James Long, do you have any other comments? I, I saw you were uh, getting a little excited about this question. Yeah, yeah. For me, it comes down to one word, and that's confidence. How do you get the confidence and trust of users, consumers, investors? Um, and really that comes down to transparency. We've seen some really interesting examples over the last few months with uh, the drug industry. So COVID vaccinations and the developments around that, understanding and providing evidence and, and data-driven design uh, to help users understand the the impact of new technologies on the place they live i'm now drifting away from the COVID version um, but understanding the examples of what it means for their their location their services their day-to-day -day life um, providing them evidence with things that they won't necessarily have seen um, prior to the, the particular deployment so i think it's about how do you bring people with you how do you whether they're investors whether they're regulators whether they're end users but confidence is everything I think we John, have our, um, yeah, go, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, John. Uh, just on the business case, I think, you know, uh, in Australia and, and uh, the mining operations, there are commercial industrial business cases for automation um, in, you know, the current maturity level, um, but also, you know, as the maturity and technology advances um, uh, with the work that's been done for the sort of on-road uh, uh, passengers sort of, consumer um, application, that's that's going to refine those models. And to your point around safety, um, the, the, the mining companies report that the, the safety benefits from using the automated haul trucks has been a significant improvement to the operation and the safety and the sort of guarantee of operation of their mine site because shutting down a mine site has a significant economic impact on that business. So there's some huge safety benefits as well as economic benefits. The other area is around defence and, and the defence sector. So we, 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 you know, we need to encourage the development to happen, um, but also to look at use cases of near term deployment. And, you know, one of um, uh, the sort of commentary that's coming out of some of the discussion forums is that, you know, the level four capable vehicles will probably be rolling off the production line of traditional OEMs in, you know, 2022, 2023. So they have that capability, say, on our freeways and urban freeways. So um, I think it won't be too long till we start seeing the safety benefits from a more wide um, consumer application of uh, advanced driver assistance technology. So um, I'm very um, confident that we'll get some data around safety benefits and see, start to validate some of the predicted models. Thanks very much. And I think uh, we are just over the time. Uh, so uh, I'd like to thank all of you, all the panelists and all the attendees uh, for, for being on this uh, panel. Very interesting uh, perspectives from all over, all the way from uh, you know government sector to private and everything else. And so um, with that, uh, I'd like to send it back to uh, the organizers. And again, thanks all. Thank you very much. Thank you.